must immediately get up and dress in full dress uh, because she has to step out and we're going into the inner chapel to pray one hour for lost humanity. And you might think that's funny, but you know what happened after I'd taken my white veil? Oh, so it was terribly pitiful. Well, I, I just guess I had more clothes to put on because a little sister wears more clothes than she for you women. And so we had a lot of clothes and I had shoes and they were high top black shoes and took a little time to lace them up and so on and so forth. And I didn't get them all on. All right, but I'll bring you back to that in just a moment. Now, I have that after breakfast is over, after we have one hour of work in the morning, after we have uh, gotten up at 4.30 sharp, a bell is tapped, and the little sisters are all awakened. Now you get up, and I know I'm going to work one hour. Whatever she tells me to do, that's what I have to do. Scrubbing, washing, ironing, whatever it is, I have to do it. All right, at the end of the hour, we go into what we call the refractory, and there we're going to have our breakfast. After the breakfast is over, we're going to the school room, and it's there right there in the convent, and we'd be five hours straight through in school. And uh, then the rest of the day, we are memorizing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prayers, six books of prayers we have to memorize. And those all have to be, be, be retained in your mind, and on and on. And uh, then uh, we have much, uh, many types of work they teach us to do, and we have that work to do. Then the evening time is coming, and we have our evening meal. Then we uh, have to walk. We just walk up and down a corridor, memorizing prayers and so on and so forth, for an hour or two. And then the time is to come back to bed. All right, now, time has come for my white veil. And you know, uh, of course, the mother superior, I thought that's what the money was given to her for, uh, for my dowry, all right? You know what she did? She wrote home to my father, and she asked my father for so much money to buy my wedding clothes with. And my father sent that check to the mother superior, and the little shopping sister went out and bought the material, and the wedding gown was made in the convent by the sisters of the open order. Now, mother and dad could have come to my wedding, but my mother is a little woman, only five foot tall. I never knew her to weigh more than 106 pounds, and she never was a well woman. So at this particular time, my mother was very ill. Dad would not come without her, and that meant they didn't get, get to come to my wedding, but they could have been there. But you know, on this morning, they had me all dressed up in that beautiful wedding gown, and it was a beautiful wedding gown, and I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. All right, over on this side, there's numbers of little sisters sitting there and several priests and bishops in the Mount Superior. All right, now, I'm coming in from back there, and behind me, I'm walking alone. My partner is a silent partner. Behind me, there are 20 little sisters uh, dressed in a portion of a holy habit, and they're walking two by two behind me. We come down to the front of the room like this, and there I have to prostrate myself down on the floor, lay my head right down on the floor. And while I'm prostrated down there, the priest steps over here and blesses me and prays for me. And then I'm going to stand on my feet and there's going to be a wedding bar, a ceremony performed. And the priest is the one who performed that wedding ceremony. And when he pronounced me the spouse of God, and as the wife of God, he placed a plain gold band ring on that finger. And I thought I was the wife of God and I didn't know any better. I believed that with all of my heart and I didn't know any better. All right. It was serious with me because I took everything. I'm that type of a person, conscientious about everything I do. All right, immediately after the wedding ceremony, then I stood up, and they had me coming around here in a room like this, and the mother tapped the bell, and two little sisters came in there, and they're going to take all my wedding clothes off of me now, and there's a long table. They lay the wedding clothes out on the table, and two little sisters walk over there and sprinkle holy, wash, uh, holy ashes and water all over those wedding clothes. Why? That belongs to the material things of the world. There'll never be another wedding for me. I'm married to God. And I know they've taught me all of this. And of course I accepted it and I believed it. All right. Now I belong to the convent. Now I am finishing my high school. Yes, I'm getting my schooling right there. Most of it. What I didn't get out of it took me through a tunnel into a school, a high school. Roman Catholic, of course. And I finished my high school. I got my high school education. I'm taking my nurse's training. They took me from the hospital. I was in a convent at night. But in the daytime, they took me uh, through a tunnel into a Roman Catholic hospital there. I'm taking my nurse's training. All right, I'd had two years of nurse's training. And uh, I was a little past 18 years old. The mother superior called me into her office this morning. She had me to sit down. And this is what she said to me. Do you realize the time is soon coming when you're going to finish your nurse's training? That means you're going to leave the convent and you'll be going out into some Roman Catholic hospital to nurse. 
And she said, do you realize that you won't be able to win as many souls for God? You won't have time to pray for a lost humanity. And then she began to paint this beautiful picture of a cloistered convent. And all folks that woman knew how to do it. She painted that beautiful picture. She said, now, if I think you have the qualities, you would make a good cloistered nun. And I believe you're the type that could go into the car cloister and say goodbye to the whole world and everything and shut yourself away to pray for lost humanity because back there I would have nothing to do. My life would be a life of prayer, meditation, study, and devotion. And she said, you can win so many more souls for God. And oh my, that was wonderful because I went into convent because I loved the Lord. And this is the only way a Roman Catholic girl knows how to give her life to God or to work for God. And so I went in freely like that. But then I didn't go find that vow then. I have a year, two years, or a year and a half before I have to make up my mind. But you know, I began to pray in the only way I know how to pray. And I began to think it over seriously. And I began to count the cost. And I began to think in my heart. And I know I'll never see mom again. I'll never see dad again. I'll never see any of my sisters and brothers again. And I'll never, never, of course, get to go home again. Because she had already told me that. The mother three had told me. That's what it meant when I went in the cloister. I'm giving up everything. All right. And you know, months and months went by, a year went by. One day I thought I counted the cost. I thought I was big enough to do it. I went to the mother superior and I said, Mother superior, I'm going to take my perpetual vows. And you know, she was very happy about things. She went on and told me this. She said, all right now, I'll have to tell you this. If I take my perpetual vows, it's not only giving up your home, not giving up your family, and not giving up the world and everything and all that, but she said it means you're not going home anymore, you're not seeing your people anymore. And she told me I would have to uh, spill my blood as Jesus shed his blood upon Calvary. And then she oh no, you don't ask any questions. She just told me that, and you don't know how you're going to spill it. Then she went on to tell me how I spend the nine hours in a casket. Bad enough to lay there when you're dead, but it's terrible when you're alive. Nine long hours in a casket. While I'm in that casket here, our services are going on over here. The priest and the little sisters are all chanting and praying. And I'm in this casket. Now that's what I'm going to be speaking about tomorrow night. I'm going to tell you why I'm in that casket. I'm going to tell you what the reason for it is. And then I'm going to give you the uh, penance, first penances I ever had. Tell you how they took me abroad again and what my penances were when I got abroad, because I'm taking my perpetual vows. I'll give you my perpetual vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience tomorrow. Don't miss tomorrow. It's the best part of the testimony. You'll know more about convents than you've ever known in your life before if you haven't been an ex-nun or an ex-sister. You'll know tomorrow night, but it is a very vital, important part of the testimony. If you miss tomorrow night and come back tomorrow and the next night, I won't have time to go back and give you a synopsis, so you won't even know what I'm talking about because I speak very fast and I don't want to keep you too long. You're working people on stuff in. I like to let you out so you'll be sure to come back tomorrow night and on and on and on. But let me give you this much. The mother superior, after all of this is transpired, now the mother superior begins to teach the little sisters there. It is not easy to be a little sister or a nun. It is a life of penance. It's a life of suffering. It is a life against nature. You don't know any of those things. You don't understand what it's like in a life of poverty. I'm going to tell you young people especially, I want you to get this if nobody else does. When I say a life against nature, and I didn't know what it was all about then. Every Friday morning after my white veil, every Friday morning we go in our cell. There they are cells. And then we must lock our door. There's a corridor out here. All right now. When I've been there, I all of my clothing down to my waistline. There are chains hanging on a nail in there. There's three chains about this long. They're interlaced together. They have sharp edges on them. I must take all my clothes down to my waistline, and I have to flagellate my body. You see, we are uh, imitating the passion and the suffering of our lovely Jesus as he walked here on earth. And that's what they teach us. We have to do. I'm bringing this body, this place, under subjection by the whipping with those chains. Those are brutal things. They hurt. They wound me. But I have to do it. And you think you're going to get by? You think you're going in there and tap yourself a few times and come out and say you took your flagellation? Well, she'll just let you strip right there. And if there isn't any stripes on your back, woe be unto you. She'll take you in there and then you won't want anything to eat for a couple, three days. You don't get away with nothing. 
So don't ever try to if you go into a convent, because they know just exactly how to catch up with you. These are convents, by the way, we're talking about, and on and on and on. It is not easy to be a sister, I can assure you. Now the Mother Superior were taught to believe this. The Mother Superior is neither a man or a woman. She is the Christ among us. And she's the only Christ I ever knew in the convent. That's the only Christ I ever knew is the Mother Superior. And I learned to hate her like I hate Satan now. I hate the sin that was in her. I hate the terrible things that she'd done. Because I lived there, that was my home for the better part of my life. And I know some of the things that went on that you don't know. Let me tell you folks. There are things going on in Cluster Convent that will never come out over the radio. The headlines are not in your newspapers. The televisions, oh no, they'll never be pictured on the television. These things are all undercover. I can assure you that. And so it's a sad place for you to send a little girl. And I hope there's nobody in the building will ever raise your child or let your child get into it. I don't care if she's a Roman Catholic. You need to find God and be delivered out of Roman Catholicism and run to the feet of Jesus and surrender your life to him and then raise your children up in the admonition of God that they don't get messed up into something like that. Now, when I realized in 1966, 3,600, 3,600 at one time, little sisters, that's the uh, sisters of the holy habit. Last year, 1,800 come out. I've had 35 and 40 in my services at a time. And they sit there and cry like little children when I'm giving my testimony. They know a lot of things that you don't know, even though you have been Roman Catholic and have been all your life. It's all undercover and you will never know because they're not going to tell you. Now you can go home and call your priest up tonight and tell him exactly what I said and he will try to tell you she's an imposter, she's a fraud. Why? Because he doesn't want you to hear the truth that will you and set you free and make you a child of God. That's the reason he'll tell you all of these things. Well, the little sisters work very, very hard. I can assure you, we washed all their dirty clothes. They'll dump all of their dirty clothes. The priest and the bishop both will come and dump all them. We didn't have any washing machines. We had the old board and, and the tub. We had to wash on the board. All right, it was very hard because we were just young kids yet. And we had to wash all of those dirty clothes and do up those white strolls the priest wore their dimps. And mine, they're very hard to do. We didn't have any electric iron. No, no, and you better not leave a spot on them. Uh, because they throw them back in the worship if they do. They got it done for nothing. And the little sisters done all of that. And they teach us to believe we're gathering for ourselves jewels in heaven. And because the Bible was a hidden book, because we have no truth, we don't know any better, and we think that's what we're supposed to do. But oh, let me say to this people tonight, how I thank God that he delivered me out of all of that. Uh, and he brought me into this marvelous life. Uh, and he saved me and filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and I was buried in the lovely name of Jesus in water baptism. And I tell you, I'm about the happiest person in the whole wide world. Because I know where I come from. Of God. My God's not dead. Yours may be dead. Mine's not dead. He's right here by my side. He stands right here every night I'm speaking. Every night. Oh, I wouldn't even come up here if he didn't. Oh, no, no. I tell you, I take him everywhere I go. In any place I can't take him, I don't go. I love him supremely. He means everything to me. All right, remember, tomorrow night, I'm going to give you my perpetual vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience. I'll give you the first three penances. And might I say to this congregation, one of the penances that I took, as after they got me abroad, may I say to you one of those penances? I didn't walk for over two months. The penance was too heavy. And so I could walk. What are they trying to do? They're breaking down my will. They're breaking me down. I'm supposed to be submissive to them, whether it's right or whether it's wrong. And so they're going to break every fine thing in me that God created within. They're going to try to destroy that. That's why we're so bound by it. I want to say God bless you, everyone. And I want to thank the Lord for the children. They haven't run in and out. I never let children run in and out of my